You know, knowledge becomes understanding, understanding becomes compassion, compassion yields to acceptance. All those things. I think people, uh, and you know, this documentary for veterans, it's very important that veterans tell their stories. And so that knowledge becomes understanding and compassion becomes acceptance. You know, I think you have to understand this is how this medication helps me. These are the consequences of my life if I don't have access to it. This is what happens. And the more people understand, then they support. And that is just as important for voters as it is for electeds. What falls under my expertise would be race relations in the United States. So, so I, I can certainly comment well on how racism helped infuse new meaning to cannabis. There's no doubt about that. You can't isolate that from all the other problems, right? The, you know, racist perceptions of people who use cannabis infused it with all kinds of new meanings. But you have to take that and you have to combine it with the sheer confusion around what cannabis is. They didn't really understand what cannabinoids were until much later. And so, you know, not only are they, are they, are they starting off with misinformation, but that misinformation is being compounded with their racist perceptions that they are projecting on on African Americans and, and, and Mexicans as well. You know, we're in the 1930s and there is this progressive era culture in the United States that's like, you know, give the government more power to protect citizens from some, some things like the Meat Inspection Act, right? The, you know, uh, all the Harrison Act of 1914, all these regulations of drugs. You know, there was this sort of like moral crusade that the government adopted. And, you know, what, what's more perfect than uh, cannabis, which has this reputation as being used for proper purposes in European traditions, for improper purposes, purposes in non-European traditions. You got this culture that's all about trying to invest more money in the government, changing its relationship between those who are governed and those who are doing the government, right? Governing, you know, they're, they're developing more of these, these social, uh, um, these social regulations and cannabis really fit the profile well for those people's agenda um, in the 1930s. You know, you never can tell what strange phenomenon is going gonna, is gonna to lead a group of people uh, to sway opinion in one direction. Most large counties in Texas have decided to not prosecute for small amounts of cannabis. The cost of two ounces of weed on the street is $500. Harris County had an officer shortage in 2019. They did a study on low-level possession of marijuana. They found out that the average officer spends four hours per arrest and the county spends about $2,390 per arrest. These officers spent time arresting people for marijuana. That's $2,390 you could spend on the backlog of rape kits. That's four hours every day a cop could spend in his community and finding out their needs. That's why, you know, the veterans are sort of voting with their feet and walking away from these pharmaceuticals and seeking their own treatment, um, alternative therapy, complementary therapies that let them take control of their own medical care. They realize that a lot of these medications are really more like chemical restraints. It's chemical restraints seem to be more, um, you know, accepting in the society we feel okay with you know, allowing these patients to be just hammered with all these pharmaceuticals. But to me, it's no different than putting somebody in, in physical restraints. It's just another method that the government has developed for keeping their public at bay. You know, so it's just easier for our government to push the pills on them. And that's why these VA contracts that Big Pharma has the tons of VA contracts for pharmaceuticals that are so lucrative. Um, and, and that's why the, the government is so happy to pay for millions and billions of dollars for these guys to be on pills. The vets come back to my office with garbage bags full of pills, full pill bottles that they've never even opened. And they, they're so afraid to, um, to, to stop taking, you know, they, they continue to pick up these pill bottles even though they never use them. They're just um, afraid of losing their benefits if they stop collecting them. And so here we have a situation where the public were now paying for these pills that the vets aren't even using. So I understand why there's this movement toward plant-based medicines because plant medicines can empower patients to 
to have control of their own lives, you know. The most like, common forms of substance abuse with veterans are alcohol, benzodiazepine, and opioids. The most misused opioids are oxycotton, codeine, and hydrocodone. Opioid misuse is up from 2.7% to 2.9% in 2018 to 2019, compared to marijuana use disorder, which went from 0.7% to 0.5% between 2018 and 2019. And since then, four states have legalized cannabis. You know, legalization of marijuana really goes hand in hand with bail reform here in Texas, um, but really kind of from a criminal justice point of view. And then you also have the medicinal points of view, which is it really provides for a lot of medical benefits. And I think you see the house shifting based on really political ideology. You have moderate Republicans or um, Republicans who are more in tune to healthcare and who are uh, educated and aware of the health benefits um, that it can provide and the pain relief that it can provide that are more inclined to support for legalization. Whereas you, what you see also is the more conservative side of the Republican Party are like, nope, it's crime. We're not, we're gonna not allow more drugs on our streets. You know, ignorance of policy <clears throat> is the bane of all politics, right? For people watching this documentary, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna care enough to find out who they are? Do those people represent you? Are you gonna vote for them again? Or are you gonna take a step back and say, you know what, this issue is important enough to me to show it at the ballot box. I wasn't gonna bring the war home with me. I wasn't gonna be distancing myself from family. I wasn't gonna let it affect me going into find jobs and work. But I say that to get to my point I made earlier, why we push it down, why we push it down. You're so we can be in society. I mean, that's, that's an easy answer. Like if we didn't push it down, there, we would be in jail. People would think we're insane. They would sedate us. We would never see the light of day. I've lost too many friends. I've lost way more friends in, for suicide than I have in combat. I was in 1-9 Field Artillery in Fort Stewart, Georgia, and one of the big things cannabis has done for me is it got me off all the opioids and off of 20 plus medications a day, and that also aided in getting off all the alcohol and stopping from the alcoholism. I was drinking 30 to 40 beers a day for almost a decade about the war, and cannabis was a, a very good patch over from pharmaceutical medicines like Seroquel that were being given to me in high doses to back to society because I was a 300 pound potato just sitting on a couch that was just zoned out all the time. I lost my family and my friends and through cannabis, I got my life back, I got healthy, I became a mayor of my hometown. So cannabis has been very valuable in my life. I'll always fight for it, I'll never stop. Got home from Iraq and they gave, put me on all kinds of antidepressants and anti-anxieties because I wasn't the same. You know, if you need to, if you need to stay up on mission, tell them you have ADHD. You'll get Adderall, and you know. So I mean, it, and they just give it straight out to you. There is no question. There is no, you know, real examination of it. If you were doing missions, they would make sure that you were missionally capable. So they would put you on all sorts of stuff. I was having blackouts out there from, you know, my explosion. I was going to a concussion clinic for it. And my, my hearing increased, not decreased, it really increased. And, you know, for a short period of time, it was like I, could, like, I couldn't even sit in the chow hall because, you know, it was just like I could hear people's, like, silverware scratching against the table and stuff, and it was driving me nuts. I really want to get at the heart of these, these, these fuzzy distinctions that we make between good drugs and bad drugs, right? I mean, really, there is no such thing as a good or a bad drug. There's only good or bad relationships that you can develop with drugs. Well, I kind of felt like that Bob Saget scene in Days, days of, uh, uh, I mean, Half Baked, you know? Y'all know the scene. I know. And I, yeah. You in here for some marijuana? Marijuana? Man, this is some bullshit! Marijuana is not a drug. I used to suck dick for coke. I seen them. Now that's an addiction, man. You ever suck some dick for marijuana? Huh? No. No, I can't say I have. I didn't think so. Oh, uh, because that was me. That was me, like, in this room of people, like, my age, 15-year-old kids that were, like, heroin addicts. I, how in the... I didn't know anything about it. I was this kid from the suburbs. But I think it's important for uh, people who support 
full legalization to be vocal and, and evident. A story, for example, is we, you know, we passed this past session one of the most transformative education bills in the state of Texas. And I'm so excited about what we're going to be able to do for our students in Texas. And I made this great post on my social media. Hey world, I've just been a part of passing one of the best education bills ever. And yes, we got great support and response and feedback on that. But then I also made a post like two days later about um, co-sponsoring uh, the bill to allow legalization of marijuana. Oh, I had so much interaction on my page. It was crazy how many people responded to that post in such a short period of time versus this transformative education bill. And it, what it really illuminated to me on social media and just the interaction that I had with my constituents is this is important and the people want to see this and the feedback that I got was overwhelming and just reinforced uh, that, to me that I was doing the right thing and I was representing my district. People are holding on to a lot of strange ideas about cannabis and I was one of those people for years my thinking was blocked by you know years of brainwashing from you know the big pharma's influence on medical school curriculum and residency training um, and finally you know I was able to slowly start to break free from that and begin thinking about the, the impact of plant-based medicines and starting to look at um, you know, it's starting to have a, a strong desire to study medically active plants that could be safer alternatives to a lot of these toxic pharmaceuticals that we're pummeling the veterans community with all the time. I, I was not a cannabis crusader. I, I got through this because I care about what Sue Sisley's doing. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If this research shows that it actually is dangerous, and there actually are problems, wouldn't we want to know that? The fact that they would withhold that information when they know full well that people throughout the country are using it every day thinking that it's helping them is just, that's a travesty. I would bet everything I have that it's going to show that it's incredibly beneficial. If it, even if it is dangerous, is it more dangerous than opioids? You know, veterans have sacrificed for our country in ways that non-veterans really can't imagine. Their families have sacrificed. They live this every day. Service-related conditions affect their lives, the lives of their families. And when they share that story with the legislators, it really helps to open their hearts and open their minds to this issue. Uh, many times we know they have PTSD issues, they have suicidal uh, issues in terms of lots of people being in pain or, or, or hurting themselves for a variety of reasons. The movement with veterans has been growing year after year in Texas, and we're going to continue in empowering and serving uh, veterans advocates to make sure that they know when, where, and how to get these laws changed. I think medical marijuana and the notion that this is a, a more humane way of helping people, even than the pharmaceutical industries propose, is something that really needs to be looked at by science. And I think in the states where we're seeing medical marijuana legal, I have not seen an upsurge in crime. So I think that these things for veterans, when you take the special or extra needs that they have because of the extra or special sacrifice that they've made. There are three types of people in the world, sheep, wolves, and sheepdogs. Some prefer to believe that the evil doesn't exist in the world, and if it ever darkened their doorsteps, they wouldn't know how to protect themselves. Those are the sheep. Then you've got the predators, the ones who use violence to prey on the weak. They're the wolves. And they're those who are blessed with the gift of aggression and overpowering need to protect the flock. These are the men and women with a rare breed who live to confront the wolf. These are the sheepdog. This is what I'm dealing with after what I just went through, you know, and like I'm begging my wife to leave and take the kids because I know that I'm an asshole. I know that I'm a monster. No, I, I didn't want to live. Let me ask you this question. How many times did you play your suicide? Uh, I couldn't tell you. A lot. Before soldiers get out of the military, they will go through a series of classes designed to help them when they get out. From obtaining a job, school, and putting your paperwork together for the VA to claiming disability. The VA cannot prescribe cannabis, but the DOD can let soldiers exiting the military know about cannabis by saying, we understand your pain. There's an alternative to the pills before you leave the military to help alleviate aches and pains as you get adjusted to civilian life. And that's cannabis. 
a safe way to deal with issues from the military before adding medication, but they're afraid to talk about it. Opioid medication and cocaine were frequently mentioned in the agents causing poisoning on death records. Veterans are tired of the treatment and are now rolling up their sleeves and becoming part of the solution. Veteran activist groups for cannabis are popping up all over the United States. Groups of veterans bringing other veterans together to heal because their faith in the system is no longer there. Uh, I'm not sure in the history of the United States we've ever had an issue that is more complex on more levels than marijuana legalization. And the reason why it's complex is because it touches on international law, United States federal law, individual state law, county and city ordinances and regulations. That's just in one part. It also touches on public health which implicates a whole range of state and federal agencies who deal with that. It implicates law enforcement uh, at every level. It implicates agricultural policy, um, environmental issues, labor and employment issues, uh, just uh, an amazing number of issues in an industry that we have no experience in. These opportunities, when legalized, present uh, growth opportunities for veterans. Absolutely. So places like here where they teach you a craft on, on teach you how to grow, whether it's vegetables, food, or your medicine, legalization allows for operations like this to exist. Yes. And to expand and to really reach out and help out veterans because we're pulling them out of the pills and out of the booze. And you're making them right. a craft, you're giving them a craft that right. is functional in society. Absolutely right. The reason why we want to do this is because a transition from military life to civilian life can be, depending on what you did and what rank you were, that's a big transition that you have to, that's a hurdle, right? So we want to be able to give the veterans that skill, teach them a trade that is going to help them, their families, and for future generations to help bring this planet back to homeostasis. Because cannabis, just like it can bring your body to balance, cannabis, if you grow the hemp and have it out in the soil, it can bring the earth back to balance. So we want to bring and incorporate all of that knowledge back to the veterans and the individuals so they can, they can go on and pass it further. There are 1.8 million veterans in Texas these are our teachers, students, barbers, business owners, community leaders, and even your family members. 5% of our counties in Texas are veterans. War creates veterans, and politicians use this as a vehicle to stay in office. The ones that have an office right now have created the veterans we have today. These are the same politicians voting no on cannabis bills. Weed for Warriors supplies medical cannabis to those veterans who cannot afford it. Vet Coalition, a Texas group dedicated to bringing like-minded vets together and push for legalization in Texas. Ananda Farms, a farm that uses farming for hemp and food as a form of therapy for veterans. A survey of the American Legion stated that 92% of all veterans support medical cannabis research. 82% of all veterans support legalizing medical cannabis, according to the American Legion survey. Legalization is coming. This seems like a no-brainer. There's so much support, it can't fail. So why is it failing? Under our system, uh, the president can't undo that with an order. It, in some countries, the president could just say, we're not going to enforce things. Uh, here, the president is stuck. The president, if he tried to uh, simply legalize it, would run into uh, the fact that he's exceeding his authority. Now, that doesn't mean the president has no authority to make certain changes, but they would have to be individual changes. The president could ask, for example, the Drug Enforcement Administration to stop enforcing it, but even he can't order them to do that. All he could do is ask them to change their rules going forward. Uh, but they're an independent agency, in the, or sorry, they're an agency in the Department of Justice, um, and they have to follow and something called the Administrative Procedure Act, which was passed by Congress, which says agencies can't just change their mind. They have to go through this long process and um, uh, get notice and you know, provide notice to people, get comments, and then explain why they did it, and then the courts review that. And so uh, the process is really difficult.